Good morning and welcome to our webinar on school finance and property taxation in the time of the coronavirus, presented jointly by Franzic PC and Chapman and Cutler. My name is Eris Dalianis, a partner at Franzic, working with many of our clients on property tax and school finance issues. We are delighted to have you with us for the next 45 minutes to discuss some of the most timely and urgent questions facing school boards and administrators. With me this morning is Aaron Bartholome, a partner at Chapman and veteran school finance and bond attorney. And my partner, Scott Metcalf, a seasoned property tax attorney and longtime observer of local government funding. I imagine that most of you are watching this webinar from home, surrounded by your children who would otherwise be at school right now or on campus in college. We hope that everyone is doing well and staying healthy. We too are at our homes and presenting this webinar while maintaining social distance. You have provided us with many good questions that we plan to address during the course of this webinar. And you can send us questions during the webinar that we will endeavor to answer as we move through the material. You can send us questions at the chat box at the bottom left of your screen. This morning, we will be covering the following topics. The timing of tax payments. Many of you have asked about this topic and we'll be addressing it first. Short-term borrowing options, which may be greatly affected by the answer to the first question. Interfund loans and transfers, federal and state funding, and the CARES Act, and then finally, how COVID-19 is impacting property assessments in taxation. With that, let's get started with Scott on the timing of tax payments. Right, whether or not the uh, tax payments will be delayed seems to be the question of the day and the question on everyone's mind. And I think in order to work our way through this question, it's, it's helpful to divide it into two buckets. One is the process of issuing tax bills and the other are the policy considerations that our government officials are gonna be evaluating. In terms of process, uh, in order for tax bills to go out, First of all, the local board of review in each county has to certify all of the assessments. Then the Department of Revenue has to issue a multiplier. Then the county clerk calculates the tax rates. And finally, the treasurer prints and mails the tax bills and, and collects the tax payments. Now in Cook County, from 1977 until 2011, the August 1st statutory deadline for the payment of tax bills had never been met before. But then in tax year 2012, there was a concerted push in Cook County to meet the August 1st deadline. And since then, they have been meeting it every year. This year in Cook County, all county agencies have started working remotely. We've, Eris and I have been very active at the Cook County Board of Review this year. And in our experience, the Cook County Board of Review appears to be on schedule to certify all of the assessments in Cook County in time for an August 1st deadline. What we know about the other Cook County agencies is that they are all working remotely right now and they are making a concerted effort to make sure that all of their administrative personnel have the capability to work remotely to get all of their tasks done in order to still meet the August 1st deadline. Now in terms of policy, that is a separate question. The process appears to be on track to meet all of the statutory deadlines for tax bills, but policymakers have to consider whether or not to bring in the tax money right away or allow taxpayers more time to pay their tax bills and thereby force governments to borrow money. We have to assume that those policy level conversations are going on in some uh, governmental units right now, um, but all we can do at this point until they make an announcement or, or those conversations become more widespread is hope for the best and plan for the worst. Outside of Cook County, it's exactly the same situation. Um, you have the same process and the same policy considerations. We've heard that uh, Lake and DuPage and Will counties 
are all on schedule to meet the August 1st, uh, well, the September 1st deadlines uh, for the second payment, as well as the June 1st uh, deadline for, for the first installment. So even though we don't know yet what is going to happen, everything still is on track for tax bills to go out on time this year. The next question is non-payment. So what happens if taxes aren't paid? Well, then the property is subject to a tax sale, which ensures that the governmental units eventually get the money that they would have gotten if the taxpayer had paid their taxes. We, are, we've, we found out that the Cook County Treasurer has already indefinitely delayed the 2019 annual tax sale, which is going to cause a little bit of concern um, going forward. The other thing we have to assume is that because of all of the economic uncertainty, the percentage of a district's levy that is collected this year will likely decline. By how much, we just don't know yet. So that, that kind of takes us to the, uh, to the end of that. I don't know if there are any questions that have come in or if we should just go ahead and move on to the next slide. Scott, real quick, we did get a question. Should we adjust the co collection rate for fall tax payments? And uh, I guess from what you're saying, if there would be widespread non-payment and a continued uh, deferral or delay of the treasurer's annual sale, when those unpaid taxes would be picked up by tax buyers, it seems to me there might be, and perhaps it would be prudent to make some type of a modest adjustment uh, in the collection rate. What do you think about that? Absolutely. And the, the big challenge that all districts are going to be facing right now is how much of an adjustment. At this point, I think the adjustment should be minimal, but the longer this goes on, the larger the adjustment that, it, that will have to be made. That makes sense. Uh, Aaron, do you want to take us into the next topic, which frankly is very closely tied to... <laughs> the timing of tax payments? Absolutely. Um, I hope everyone can hear me all right. Uh, this is a unique way of presenting, but it's very modern and it's um, exciting to be able to talk to over 200 people this morning if all the registrants actually called in. Um, Eris and Scott reached out to me not, not five days ago to ask if we wanted to co-host this webinar and it's clear that um, it's a very timely topic and that everyone has great concerns. So we're happy to uh, be able to get in front of you in this manner today to try to help with some planning and some ideas. Um, hopefully, maybe some of these things won't be necessary, but it's good to, to know what your options are. So um, I'm tasked with talk, talking about the borrowing alternatives um, in the case of uh, especially late timing of tax payments um, brings us to this topic um, to bridge that timing gap that may occur and remember, as Scott just said, that in the not so distant past, late tax payments, at least in Cook County, were a reality. Uh, and not so long ago, the due date for second installment payments were actually in early December, so quite far beyond um, the August-September deadline uh, that we're used to lately. So here on this slide, you can see the numerous types of short-term borrowings available for school districts, uh, the most common of which are TAWs. Um, I'll talk about lines of credit and some of these more rare borrowing alternatives that you may not be aware of. Um, so moving on to TAWS, uh, Section 17.6 of the school code authorizes the issuance of tax anticipation warrants. Um, and although I just showed you several options for legal borrowings, by far the most common are, are these tax anticipation warrants or TAWS. And TAWS are aptly named. A warrant is basically an IOU. And in this case, it would be issued to a holder or lender in anticipation of taxes that have been levied but not yet collected. Um, and a TAW is payable only from those taxes. So in that sense, it's an anticipatory borrowing, not unlike a payday loan against your paycheck. Uh, TAWs have fixed maturity dates. So if you issue TAWs in September, you would promise a holder to pay them back on a date certain. That date is typically 60 days after the ex expectation expected date of tax collections. You could also make them prepayable, so that if taxes were collected earlier than you anticipated, you could pay off the holder and stop paying interest. And that being said, remember that a TAW is a loan. The lender who purchases the TAW from you 
will require a rate of return. But because these are short-term instruments, the interest rates should be quite low. So moving on to the next slide. Sorry, let's go back to the... Eris, can you take us to the state law yep. formula? Thank you. I just sure did. Thank you very much. You're good. Okay, so the amount of TA is limited by the formula set out in the school code, which you can see here. And if you keep these slides for posterity, you can figure out your own formula by plugging in your specific dollar amounts and rates. But basically, you can borrow up to 85% of your levy for any given fund, and you can issue TA as an anticipation of the taxes to be collected for your various funds. So you can issue ad fund TAWs or O&M fund TAWs or transportation fund TAWs, et cetera. You can issue them from payable from any of your funds that you levy taxes for. The amount you can issue is limited by the amount of taxes not yet collected. So if you're planning to borrow over the summer after the receipt of the first installment, you'll be limited to 85% of the as yet uncollected taxes. Um, you're further limited by the amount of available cash you have in your working cash fund. So the idea is that basically you should use that money in your working cash fund rather than issue TAWs, and I will touch on that again later. Okay, we can move to the next slide. Um, instead of issuing TAWs, you can establish a line of credit at a bank, and that would allow you to draw money as you need it rather than issuing a single TAW on a single date. Uh, the line of credit that was like a TAW from a legal standpoint, it's entered into in anticipation of taxes levied but not yet collected. And it's limited to the same statutory formula that I showed you on the previous slide. And lines of credit for school districts are not like your personal line of credit or a corporate line of credit that's a revolver. They are like a TAW. They can only be issued into once a year based on the taxes levied for that year. So you would re need to reauthorize them annually. Um, the, the difference between a line of credit and a TAW is really just the flexibility in terms of the, the timing of the draws. Okay, we can move on to the next slide. State aid anticipation certificates are issued in anticipation of upcoming receipt of state aid. And I'm not going to spend too much time on the next few slides because they are very rarely used. Um, as I said, the TAWs and the lines of credit are the most common and the ones that lenders are most familiar with. But um, in terms of state aid anticipation certificates, they're not as easy to market as TAWs. And obviously, they're reliant on the ability of the state to pay state aid. So it's not just based on the credit of the district. And uh, they're usually only issued in extreme dire circumstances. But here you can see the specifics about them. They need to mature within 13 months, and they're payable solely from state aid. Uh, the amount borrowed cannot exceed 75% of your state aid. And state aid certificates and TAWs cannot exceed 85% of your taxes levied for that year. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. So personal property replacement tax nodes are similarly uncommon as the previous borrowing alternative. And they're also backed by an unlimited tax levy. So if you're tax capped, this is not an option for your district. But here you can see the specifics about them in terms of the limitations on the amount and the maturity uh, limitations. The next slide please, thank you. Uh, revenue anticipation notes are a bit more common, and they're a borrowing alternative for all units of local government, so I think that banks um, and holders are a bit more familiar with them, but they're, again, much less commonly used than tax anticipation warrants, um, and I have not seen them used in several years, and they are issued in anticipation of any reliable revenue source. So these days, typically a reliable revenue source would be federal or state aid that you're expecting or local fees um, that you're expecting that considered, you know, can, can, can be considered to be reliable. Um, in this day's day, it would be interesting to see what a bank or a lender would think about that reliable revenue source. Um, here, uniquely, the school board is required to have a two-third vote to uh, to authorize these, so that's a unique factor about those. Um, on to the next slide. Lines of credit can also be used um, in lieu of issuing state aid anticipation certificates or revenue anticipation notes, uh, and this again is not a very popular borrowing alternative. 
Uh, let's move on to the next slide. Teachers' orders are sort of a Depression-era borrowing alternative and have not been used very much in modern times. I have seen districts use them to create a claim for the issuance of funding bonds. Funding bonds are a longer-term borrowing alternative that are backed by tax levies and are used to pay claims in the districts. So these, this is sort of the, the details about teachers' orders. Um, they're basically IOUs to banks where the bank will step in and agree to accept the orders and, uh, and fund the money to pay the teachers. And they don't have a fixed maturity date, and they're usually taken out by funding bonds. Um, let's move on to the next slide. So I've run through all the borrowing alternatives. As you can see, I would basically recommend starting with TAWs or possibly a line of credits. They're the most common form of financing, and they're understood and recognized by banks. And a TAW is a security and a negotiable instrument and can trade like a bond. Because it's a short term, it should not require a credit rating, and the interest rates should be relatively low. And you can even sell it to a neighboring school district if someone else has cash and they're looking to invest in. So on this slide, we can see another idea is lending money to yourself with interfund loans if you have um, funds that can afford to lend back and forth. And so Section 10-22.33 of the school code permits the following um, interfund loans to be made. So you can move among the, the major funds, and you have to repay them within three years. So that's a fairly flexible way to uh, access money. All right, on the next slide, we'll talk about using your working cash fund. Um, you can transfer money from the working cash fund. A transfer in this terms really means a loan that needs to be repaid and repaid when taxes are collected. So that's a lot like issuing a TAW. Uh, if you want to move money out of the fund permanently, you can abate or abolish the fund. Abating the fund would be I'm sorry, I moved on to the next slide here. This previous slide shows oh, you sorry. here the yep. amount that, this shows you the amount that can be uh, can be transferred. So here I'm going to talk about permanent transfers. Um, the first is the concept of abating, and abating the fund is a partial permanent transfer that does not need to be repaid. So the previous slide I was talking about transfers, which are basically loans that are required to be repaid. <clears throat> and you can abate to any fund. Um, another alternative that's permanent is a working cash fund abolishment. And you can do that any year. It needs to be done at the end of the fiscal year. Um, and the money goes to the ed fund. As opposed to the abatement, which is only partial, under the abatement scenario, the money can go to any fund that's most in need. So if you're considering abolishing your working cash fund, now is a good time of the year to consider that because you could do that as of June 30th and then recreate it anytime after July 1st. Um, so the final idea, and I don't have a slide for it, would be the issuance of actually working cash fund bonds. Um, I could do a whole other presentation on that idea called medium-term borrowing alternatives. We could do that later in the future. but. Um, those are the basic borrowing alternatives, and I think we're going to move on now to interfund transfers. Yes, and thank you, Erin. And before we get to the next one, we have a bunch of questions here, and I thought this might be a good time to address some of them. So for uh, here's a question, and this is typical. What authority does a county have in choosing to delay payments? And I, I think Scott addressed it in the sense of, you know, you do have, at least outside of Cook, these statutory dates of June 1 and September 1, I personally don't think a county board could unilaterally on its own say we're going to delay, say, the September payment or direct the treasurer to not uh, collect or, or something like that. I think you would need action from the General Assembly for purposes of whether that authority exists. So in Cook, it's a little different. Scott addressed the fact, and I think Aaron talked about it too, that you know, if you look back, say, 10 or 12 years, you've got second installment dates that go as late as mid-December. Uh, the assessor and the Board of Review have done a, a good job over the last few years of moving the process along a lot faster. So we can do an August 1 date. But again, for policy reasons, I think it is certainly something within the realm of possibility that that second installment date might be kicked out, just not as sort of a, a necessary thing to do from 
the mechanics of extending and, and sending bills, but just from a practical perspective. And then we've got another question here, Scott, I don't know if you want to address this. Will lower the EAV due to, to, to the depressed economy impact collections? Uh, not necessarily collections. A depressed EAV is going to definitely increase your tax rate. And um, th whether or not that ultimately affects your collections has to do with how close you are to your, your tax rate limit. So each fund has a, a, a maximum statutory limit, and once that is hit, the tax rate can't go any higher. And so in a scenario where there is depressed EAV, the loss of collection would, would result from hitting the, the rate limit. Okay, and then here's sort of a related question too, is if homeowners escrow, prop, escrow their property taxes, which many do, how does delaying taxes help? And I think the answer is, it really doesn't help because these funds are being held by the mortgage servicer who on a, a date certain will just make an electronic funds transfer to get those, uh, those payments in. So to the extent people are escrowing taxes, and I, and I think it's a sizable percentage of homeowners with a mortgage who do that, uh, a delay doesn't really do any good because they're paying every month. A chunk of their mortgage payment is actually going towards taxes as well. And then one more Aris, I want to yeah, address Aris, because I think that's I think yeah, that's absolutely ahead. right, Eris. I I just wanted to to interject that the benefit of a delayed tax uh, payment would be primarily for the owners of apartment buildings um, who are not you know escrowing their 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 property tax payments, and also for more of the commercial and industrial sector which is, is essentially being shut down right now. So even if the impact on the individual homeowner from a delayed due date is, is minimal, the benefit would be more for the commercial uh, property owners. Absolutely. Uh, and then one more I wanna address before we move on to the next subject is, uh, I, I have heard this also, but one of our, our participants here is, is letting us know that in Kane County, there is some talk about waiving the penalty fee for late payment. Uh, this would ensure that the escrow taxes would be received on time, but the remaining taxes would be delayed up to 90 days. I I've heard of this, uh, that that's come either from the county treasurer or the county board. You know, the bottom line is the, the late payment percentage for unpaid taxes is one and a half percent per month or 18% a year. I don't think a county treasurer has the authority to not, uh, invoke that provision and, and apply that interest rate. So again, we're getting back to things the General Assembly would have to do in order to legally allow these, these things to happen. So uh, thank you all for your questions. There's a lot more piling up. We are going to get to them. I wanted to just keep moving through and we will intersperse our discussions with, with additional answers to your questions. So the next interfund transfer, um, Aaron talked about a number of options, and this is one that we see all the time. Section 17-2A of the Illinois School Code authorizes permanent fund transfers uh, between and among the, the funds we've identified here. Uh, it has to be done by a board resolution. Uh, it is a permanent transfer per the act. Uh, in order to do it, you have to have a public hearing. The public hearing has to be published notice in a newspaper no less than seven, no more than 30 days before the public hearing. Uh, you've also got to post notice of the public hearing at least 48 hours. Normally these public hearings are part and parcel of a normal board meeting when they're done. And this is the statute, and you're probably familiar with it, where it has an end date that is regularly extended. The current end date on this authority is June 30th of 2020. My guess is that whatever omnibus legislation makes its way through the General Assembly addressing all the issues uh, arising because of the coronavirus, this will likely be part of it as it has been periodically extended going back almost 20 years in two or three year chunks. So this is an option for you as well, something a lot of our clients are, are currently doing. Okay, our last topic uh, in, this, in this area is the transfer of interest earnings which is something that a lot of our, our client school districts uh, do on a, on a regular basis, which is sweep the interest from their various funds to the fund most in need. 
This is authorized by the Local Government Debt Reform Act, uh, but it's also referred to in Section 10-22.44 of the school code. So the limitations on these types of transfers are, are first, that a board resolution is required, um, and secondly, it's important to remember that it does not apply to interest earned in prior fiscal years. That interest that was earned in prior fiscal years is now considered principal, and so it, it cannot be transferred under the ISBE regulations. Under the Local Government Debt Reform Act, you cannot transfer interest earnings that were earmarked for a particular purpose. You can also cannot transfer interest out of either the IMRF or the TORC fund. Now, Section 10-22.44 of the school code also adds additional limitations, which are that you cannot transfer interest out of the prior fire prevention fund or from the capital improvements fund. But um, those, those, are the, uh, those are basically the borrowing and transfer options that we were wanted to discuss today. So it's time now to transfer over to the topic of state funding, which is another huge question that I know everyone is facing. And I wish right now more than ever that I was able to predict the future, um, but I'm still unable to do that. What I can do is at least reiterate the research that experts have already done on this and pass that information along. Um, the Commission on Government Forecasting and Accountability, which is a nonpartisan government agency, issued a revenue estimate in March of this year based on past economic downturns. And what they said in that report and I'm quoting here, attempting to value the impact of COVID-19 on state revenues is virtually impossible. Now, when we look at state revenues and how that might impact education funding, it's important to keep in mind that income tax accounts for approximately 50% of state revenues, and sales tax accounts for approximately 25% of state revenues. Both of those revenue sources are going to be hit by what is going on in the economy right now. And so then the commission went on to look at three different scenarios. And basically they said, if this is like the 2001 downturn, general revenue fund revenues will decline by $2 billion. If it's like 2008, general revenue fund revenues will decline by about $4.5 billion. And if it is like the worst case scenarios for what the COVID-19 recession will look like, it's a 20% decline in state uh, general fund revenue uh, projections, and that means $8 billion over seven, several years. Um, so even though it's too soon to predict what education funding will look like for the 2021 fiscal year, it's not too soon to project that there will be incredible pressures on the state budget this year. And we will have to just get through this year as best we can. But hopefully the federal that, government will help us out. Yeah. Yeah, so let's talk about that. Uh, thank you, Scott. So uh, you, if you watch the news, if you read the newspaper, you could not help but have seen that last week there was a lot of activity in Washington, D.C. First, the Senate and then the House approved this CARES Act, which is a $2 trillion package of stimulus and other goodies for various industries and interest groups. Uh, part of this includes what's known as the Education Stabilization Fund. It's $30.75 billion. Of that, $13.5 billion is being allocated to K-12 education, which includes charter schools as well. The key thing to remember here is that of this $13.5 billion, 90% is allocated for school districts and charter schools based on the allocation of Title I-A funds. So just look at your own school district, think about whether uh, you have much funding from Title I, and that will be what you can expect from this Educational Stabilization Fund and from the CARES Act generally. That's 90% of the $13.5 billion. The other 10% is set aside for emergency needs 
at the discretion of the state governor. And so what are we talking about? What are the kinds of things that the $13.5 billion can be used for? I've identified a couple here, planning and coordinating for long-term school closures. A lot of this is related to purchasing and making ed tech available. Uh, certainly different communities have different capacity for ed tech as things stand right now in terms of Wi-Fi and uh, technology at home. Other approved activities are cleaning and sanitizing schools, uh, helping low-income families access technology and long-term learning, uh, coordinating meals and connectivity. Uh, some of these funds are designed for mental health services. And uh, it also, and, and this is a big issue, is planning and delivering summer learning. I think we all sort of realistically have to acknowledge that there may be some learning loss that goes on uh, as part of the distance learning and remote learning uh, in terms of what kids are, 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 are getting. And so part of the funding will be for summer learning as well. So that is, that's what we're talking about here. In addition, on top of the 13.5, there is a $3 billion fund for governors to distribute in their discretion supporting both K-12 and institutes of higher ed most impacted by the coronavirus. And so the real question here then is how to access all this money. And our understanding, and I haven't seen any, any crystal clear guidance, is this will be flowing through uh, the states, uh, through the Illinois State Board of Higher Education, I'm sorry, ISBE, Illinois State Board of Education. Uh, it will be done in the form of grants and other payments. Uh, beyond that, I, I do not know and I have not heard how this money will flow. It's our study of the CARES Act that it could take up to 60 days, at least via the act, for some of these monies to uh, start flowing to your districts to the extent you're entitled to these funds. So uh, this is not something that's going to happen overnight, and I think a lot of this is going to be driven by when uh, schools actually reopen, if, if they do, for this school year, and then what things look like over the summer as schools try to address learning loss and provide summer learning opportunities. So, Aaron, Scott, do you have anything to add on, on the CARES Act yourselves? No, I think you did a great job no. summarizing what we know yeah, about no. it so far. Perfect. Yeah, so let's do this then. Let's, before we jump into the assessment issues, I, we have a bunch more questions that I would like to talk through some of these quickly, and then we'll go on to the property taxation uh, subject matter as well. So. Here's one question we got. Uh, are we talking about adjustments in the collection rate in the payments we're receiving now, or are we concerned with the collection rate in the fall? And uh, I, Scott, I think we're really more concerned about the fall collection rate, don't you think? Since the first installment, at least in Cook, came in, in as of March 1 before all this uh, parade of horribles started to happen. Would you agree with that? I agree. And I mean, we are just at the very beginning of the economic effects of this. And so even if you have a June 1st deadline outside of Cook County, I would still be more concerned about the second installment. Uh, Aaron, here's a question for you. Will short-term borrowing restrictions slash guidelines be lifted to allow for more fluid actions with school boards? What, what's your sense on that? I mean, I saw that question, and I'm not sure that I completely understand it. In terms of restrictions, uh, with TAWs, I mean, the, the main restrictions are um, the, the amount that you can borrow and the amount that the borrowing can remain outstanding. Um, I don't see the amount that you can borrow being changed unless it's done statutorily. I will tell you that um, several years ago when we were in 2008 and 2009, the community colleges managed to get their uh, short-term borrowing ability to be doubled. Um, so basically, for working cash fund bonds, they could they could borrow twice as much, and that might be something that we could look at in terms of creative legislation. Right now, unfortunately, the general assembly is not even in session, so um, we're going to be limited by the by the existing guidelines at least immediately. The one thing that I would encourage people to think about is you know going ahead and talking to your school boards about at least investigating the concept of doing, setting yourself up to do a short-term borrowing, like a TAR, a line of credit. Um, it just takes one board meeting to authorize. 
and the board could authorize doing it and not ever pull the trigger, but you could get yourself into a position to be able to quickly if necessary. And then I did see another question floating down there about whether there's going to be concern about the market being flooded with people looking for lines of credit and TAWs. And I think that's a good question. Um, you know, the banks, um, the banks have responded well in the past in times of crisis, particularly your local lenders. So when you're thinking about talking to your school boards about just getting the authority to pull the trigger, you may also be talking to your local banks um, where you keep your accounts about whether they have any appetite to lend you or to create a line of credit for you and or your financial advisors um, you know, can give you a sense of what the market is like right now and the accessibility of it. Hey, Aaron, here's another one for you. Uh, are four counties where they've got this 1% sales tax that is used for school building purposes, mm -hmm. is that something that, what's your reaction to to that? Is that something that will, obviously we're going to see a drop in sales tax receipts. How, how yeah. does that affect this? So the concern about that is twofold. One, if you're just doing pay-go projects with your sales tax money, um, you know, those may be impacted or slowed down. But for people who have issued bonds that are secured by sales taxes, and there are many people out there that have done that, those bonds were typically issued as alternate bonds where the sales tax was the primary revenue source, but there's a backup tax levy on those bonds. And um, what you promised your bondholders is, if your if your primary revenue source being the sales taxes is insufficient to make those payments, that you would go ahead and levy and extend the taxes that were levied at the time the bonds were issued. So if you're falling into that category, I would certainly recommend that you you know we keep an eye on this quickly to see whether you're going to have the ability to make your bond payments and what you should do um, as a result, either using other funds to make those or letting the taxes be extended. And would be happy to chat with um, people individually on their, you know, on their individual scenarios. Just give us a call, and we can talk through it. So let's do this, gang. Let's move on to the effects of COVID-19 and property taxation because we've got a little less than 10 minutes here remaining, and I just want to make sure we cover this because this is going to be a big deal for everybody. So starting with the 2020 reassessment in Cook County, so it's really the Southlands that are being reassessed, uh, the South and Southwest Suburban Townships. So uh, Fritz Kage, the Cook County Assessor, is, is tapped the brakes on the process right now. He's not issuing any new reassessments. He's extended all the deadlines. Uh, there's really not a lot happening. His office is closed to the public. There are many more townships left to go, but he has halted the process for the time being. Uh, of equal moment is what is going to be happening in non-reassessment jurisdictions. So 2019 was a quadrennial reassessment for all the, the collar counties in the Chicago area. Uh, and it, it was also the north and north uh, west suburban uh, suburbs in Cook, too. So these would all be non-reassessment jurisdictions, as would the city of Chicago. I, I would expect a higher appeal volume in 2020. And that would be at the local township assessor level, where there are township assessors, at the county board of review level, and then also uh, likely those appeals would sort of graduate to either the PTAB or the circuit court via the filing of valuation objections. Uh, Cook County Board of Review is winding down. They're, they're concluding the last group of townships in their final grouping. Other boards of review are done, uh, Will, Lake, uh, DuPage have all been done since really the early part of March, as Scott had talked about earlier. And so what, what we want to talk about now is what we're hearing from appraisers. So Scott and I work with a lot of different appraisers on all kinds of property types, and we talk to these folks all the time. And in preparation for this webinar, we interviewed several that we like, respect, and have a long track record uh, of, of being knowledgeable and knowing the market. So what we're going to share with you now on this slide and the next two is really just sort of raw data from them having viewed this thing for about a month now and what they think is going to be happening. So in terms of hospitality, meaning restaurants, bars, hotels, it's been described to us by multiple appraisers as a train wreck when you've got hotels with 10% occupancy 
You've got bars and restaurants that are closed and no foreseeable opening date coming. Uh, right now, the sense is industrial is not going to be impacted. And that's sort of evident when you look at, you know, Amazon announcing that it wants to hire 100,000 new people. These fulfillment centers are continuing to pop up. I think one thing we've learned from this whole uh, episode is the, uh, the value of e-commerce. And a lot of e-commerce flows through industrial warehouse buildings. Uh, unlike 2008, what we're hearing is there's a lot of liquidity. The Fed has certainly acted. Uh, rates are extremely low, and banks are continuing to lend, at least for the time being. Uh, what appraisers are telling us is for the highly leveraged, you know, no surprise here, uh, could be some real problems down the road. And then, again, a lot of this really ties to everything we're saying today ties to the duration of the event itself. Sure. Um, and Scott? from from a little bit more from some of the other appraisers, um, most investors that they work with are concerned about Cook County, and that stems largely from the uncertainty about the reassessments, but also about the real estate market in general. Um, competition from Indiana and Wisconsin will still be there and probably only increase in Lake and Will counties. And DuPage County is probably the best positioned from a real estate perspective to come out of this on the other side in the best position. Um, the impact on the real estate market is going to vary by economic sector. Many restaurants and bars won't survive. And as a result, this will mean a glut of vacant and available property on the market, which will just drive down the real estate values for those properties. Grocery stores, however, are doing extremely well. Um, and online retailer, retailing and remote working will likely increase in the future um, because people have just gotten so accustomed to doing that during, during the stay-at-home order. And that will mean increases in the value of um, of industrial space and warehouse space and data centers, but it will also probably impact the, um, the value of office space because people are already considering how much office space they really need in order to do their jobs. At the end of the day, though, they're t everyone is telling us that every property is going to be different. It's going to tell a different story, and it's going to take at least the remainder of this calendar year to work through all of the Im economic impacts and for recovery to begin. Um, they, uh, th this next slide shows one of the extraordinary assumptions that these appraisers are including in their reports. And the key points to take away from this are that the impact on the real estate market is currently unknown. And the impact is going to depend on the scale and length of the outbreak. The stay-at-home orders are going to hit the hospitality and retail sectors first, but the longer this goes on, the more likely it is to spread to other sectors of the economy. And due to this uncertainty right now, everyone is saying in their appraisals, these real estate values may change very rapidly in the near future. So you have to check back with us and check back in about the value of these, um, of these assumptions. And then finally, and Scott, real we're quick, also can I, dealing. Can I chime in, yeah, Scott? Yeah. But well, just real quick, just so people know what an extraordinary assumption is. So when an appraiser writes a report, he or she makes certain assumptions, and typically the assumptions are not extraordinary. They're, they assume you know, market interest rates. They assume market occupancy, stabilization, absorption, et cetera. An extraordinary assumption is added when there's something very unusual going on, either with the development of the appraisal report or with the market. So the fact that this extraordinary assumption is now beginning to show up or versions of it, we realize there's a lot of words on the screen, but we just wanted to give you the whole thing, tells you that appraisers are acknowledging this and making a point of pointing it out in a sense as part of the work that they're doing. So sorry about that. Yep. No. Uh, so this is this is our last slide before the questions, and it's basically a summary of what we are hearing from the taxpayers' attorneys, and large owners, especially in the retail industry, are very nervous, and this is going to be particularly true of your mall owners, because as one of the previous slides indicated, 
the class um, class A malls like your Woodfield or your Old Orchard are going to be in the best position to come out of this current crisis all right, but your class B and your class C malls, which um, don't have as strong of a revenue stream, are going to be impacted much more heavily. Um, large retailers, um, everything from sporting goods stores to, to jewelry stores have stocks sitting on their shelves and they don't know when they are going to be able to reopen and start, um, start generating revenue. And important tenants are already declaring that they are not going to pay rent. Last week, the Cheesecake Factory announced that it, it will not be paying its April rent for its 96 uh, restaurants across the United States. Um, Wendy's restaurants, Subway restaurants, and Mattress Firm are all taking similar steps to either adjust their franchise fees or just not pay rent on their properties. And a lot of landlords are anticipating requests for rent concessions from their tenants, which will ultimately drive down the value of these, uh, of these commercial and industrial properties. So I know that I saw one question about how this will impact the 2019 reassessments that have already taken place, um, both in the north suburbs of Cook County and in the, in the um, collar counties because of the quadrennial reassessment. And I think it, what this means is that even though an assessment was set in 2019, that in 2020, a large number of property owners are going to go back to the boards of review and seek further reductions because of a change in economic circumstances. I don't know, Eris, do you feel the same way? Oh, I absolutely do. And I, I think, just think about the super regional malls that you probably drive by from time to time during the normal moving about that you do or used to do uh, in, your, in your normal life. So the Old Orchards, the Lincoln Wood Town Center, the Woodfields, the Oak Brook, the River Oak, the Orland Square Mall, the North Riverside Mall, Stratford, uh, et cetera. You know, the Sears is have closed, the Carsons have closed. You know, a while ago, the Sports Authorities and the Toys R Us and Pennies is really, I think their, their, their stock is selling at like 40 cents a share. And it used to be a lot higher than that. These folks are on the ropes. And unfortunately, I think we're going to be seeing more businesses like that close down. And I, I think we're going to see these folks coming in in 2020 seeking additional relief, even if normally, uh, at least in Cook County and, and elsewhere, you would get the number you're going to get for the first year of the tri or the first year of the quad. And then that's it. You, you live with that number. That's typically sort of the informal arrangement that exists. But um, with that, we have exceeded the time limit of this webinar, and uh, we have so many other questions. I would you know, just encourage you to reach out to Scott, Aaron, or me. We're happy to answer these questions kind of in a one-on-one -on -one situation. Uh, I do want to thank Aaron and Scott for sharing their expertise, and I want to thank each of you for joining us this morning. Your questions were extremely valuable. We greatly appreciate your time and those questions. We'll be making the webinar available on the Franzic website later today for viewing. Uh, feel free to share the link to this archived webinar with your colleagues and friends. Thank you again. Stay safe and be healthy.